Deb, you're such a good reporter. <laughs> I think I've been criticized in this podcast before. Probably. For my reporting skills, actually. Fairly so, I would say. Yes. But you're such a good reporter. And there's a story that I literally just can't wrap my head around. And because I think you have a better experience with the people involved, not personally, but as a viewer, I'm going to ask that you put on your best Edward R. Murrow oh. award-winning hat. I can do that. I and explain that. to me, because I kind of get it, but I don't. Okay. The Erica Jane Real Housewives oh, divorce. Yeah. I yeah, I yeah, yeah, yeah. I know about it. I know we have a listener, Amanda, who's a friend of the show, who's tried to tell me about it, and she's going to love this topic. I can't really understand what's happening, who I should blame, and if everybody involves, awful. Okay, so for the sake of this Edward R. Murrow report, yes, the facts may be. Do we need? Do we need blurry. to bring in some breaking news here? Yes, some, yes, yes. Yeah. Live from the Devin Kev Studios, it's the Edward R. Murrow segment with your host Deb Zener. Who will offer vague facts. Okay. Facts. Fair. In quotes. Listen, <laughs> okay, there facts. is nothing that we will pin our hopes on more than vague facts, vague facts when it relates to this topic. So there's a whole bunch of stuff I think. So I'm going to say what I think, which means I don't know. Background. We're talking about a Beverly Hills housewife from Bravo. She is a Beverly Hills okay. housewife. Yes. But I think the I think Tom Girardi, who is her husband, who is a really famous attorney. He is a really famous attorney from the movie Aaron Brockovich. Aaron Brockovich. Got it. So he's that, you know, if you think of the actor, he's that well-loved kind of, at least this is how he came across in the movie, you know, smart but goofy, you know, not trusting Aaron and all of that. God you know forbid mean? movies take liberties with people. And certainly not he there was nothing that depicted him as soon would be famous. It did depict him as soon would be rich. Very at the end rich. Of the movie, yes. right? But not soon soon would be famous. Needless to say, Erica Jane wasn't a part of that movie. E Erica Jane was not a part of that movie. Uh, but I do think they've been uh, they've been married for twenty years. I've done some cursory research on this subject, and they have been married for twenty two years. They were married in nineteen ninety nine. When was Aaron Brockovich? Out. I don't know, but you keep telling the story. Okay. I'll figure that out. So, uh, so I will say there was a time that this was a very well loved and well respected attorney, meaning, you know, publicly well loved and publicly well respected. The movie came out in the year two thousand. So they just were married. Yes, you know what I mean. With when, when all of that happened, so um, she's from somewhere in Georgia. Yep. And you know, I think, and she had—I don't know if she was married before, but she has a son from a previous relationship who is a cop in LA. Correct. And um, and I do think that from what we've heard, you know, Tom sounds like you know Tom has been good to that son. Do you know what I mean? Like Got embraced it. him as well. So I guess somewhere along the line, and I don't know where, you know, she decided she wanted to be much more than Tom Girardi's wife. And we should point out that their age gap is 33 years. 33 years. Okay. So the thing that she decided to do was be kind of a vampy uh, singer, dancer, Probably strict use of auto tunes. I'm gonna guess. What's vampy mean? Well, you know, kind of ris a little risqueish. Got it. Okay. Okay. Um, vampy. Add that to the catalog of words I never never vampy. knew about. I was gonna give her campy, but I don't know if I want to give her that. Do you know what I mean? Well, from the TV show we've watched, campy apparently means it's canon. Is she that? Would she be considered that amongst her adoring fans? What What was the word you said? Canon. Like it becomes part of the ethos. It becomes something that you can build a foundation upon. I don't know that I can comfortably give her that. Fair okay. enough. So here's the here's the problem that I see. Does she look like kind of amazing for her age? Well, yeah, she's 50. She looks amazing. Yes. But she also looks like, I mean, she also looks like they're trying to turn her into a Barbie doll. Let's not lie. Oh, yeah. I mean, everything has been nipped and tucked and plumped and yeah. 
filled and Botoxed and whoever her surgeon is does a great does job. Does a great job. And then she's got this whole team, which you have seen on the Beverly Hills housewife. Yeah. A literal you know I mean? team of people around her. That are like, I mean, dressing her hair, makeup, I mean, beyond. Okay. Correct. So does she look great? Yes, she does. The other thing I want to say in her defense is are these personas on these quote reality TV shows? I mean, is that who these people really are? I don't know. That remains for another discussion. Sure. But so she, I thought that their relationship in the beginning looked a little stilted, but then I kind of attributed it to, you know, this is a real lawyer with a real reputation. I mean, like he's they made not, a movie about him. Yeah. He's not going to jump on board with this nonsense. Right. So I always felt like in the beginning, his, a little standoffish thing was that. Okay. Sure. Then it seems like there were a lot of comments about that. So they got him to appear where he seemed much warmer, you know, much more caring about her uh, because he was a little, he was a little bossy of her, as I recall. Got it. So you were kind of like, Ooh, what's really going on? I feel here? like that would come with the 33 year age gap where the, the seniority would shine through in some capacity. Right. Well, and you have all the money. Very Let's true as well. About that. They, they okay. met, and she was she was nothing more than an aspiring actress in LA as a waitress. As a waitress, exactly. So you know, we do know that money wields power as well. So then they did a whole little thing where there were these tidbits of you know uh, Tom being nice to Erica. Oh well, that's nice. You know, Tom being proud of Erica. So it did feel that part always felt a little scripted to me. Which I'm very sure it was. What do I care about their marriage? Honestly, that's not even the deal. Totally. Right? I always felt because not knowing like it takes a lot of money to try to start a career like hers, especially at the age she is. She's got to look like a million bucks, yep. got to be able to do everything. Um, I always felt that, I mean, Tom must have funded that because I think she has never had a job I sure. mean, since she married him, right. a job, job. Right. But then, you know, once they go on the housewives often they're divorced shortly after, I mean, it's kind of the thing of seeing, you know, the somehow they think of yeah, things to come. Somehow they think going on the reality TV show where cameras are put in front of you are is somehow yes. going to help your failing marriage. Exactly. Or it's going to give her a nice little income so that you don't have to take care of her when your marriage fails. True. Okay. But I do know that she's, I mean, she was on Broadway. I think it got cut short because of COVID, but she was on Broadway. She does shows that, I mean, like these live shows, there's definitely an audience for them. So, and she's on The Housewives. So right. it does feel like she's capable of making an above average income that I would at least hope would support, because this is the business person in me talking, her thing. Do you know what I mean? That yeah. she wouldn't have to be going back to the he, well. He gave her the seeds. She planted them. And from that, she was able to carve out a nice little career for herself. Right. Now, these are all Deb's assumptions. DA, Deb's assumptions. DAs. Deb's Not district attorneys. Yeah. Deb's, Deb's assumptions. assumptions. Okay. Got it. Um, and in that scenario, I'm giving everybody the benefit of the doubt. I mean, so, I think you no are probably judgment. being very yes. soft handed right yes. now. So now here's the Erica Jane things that were kind of a problem for me. If the even the tiniest little thing goes awry, Erica Jane will cut you till you bleed. I mean, there is no middle ground. There's no warning for it coming. If she even perceives it as a baby tiny slight, I mean, she's going to wield her sword like a wild woman. And she does it all with RBF. What's RBF? Resting. Mm, Resting bitch I mean, like the oh. most severe you've ever seen. Right. But I mean. It's probably plastic surgery. It's, it's not moving surgery, at all. for sure. But it is intimidating. Oh, God. I would be intimidated. That one, there's one scene where she rips Teddy Mellencamp, a new one. And I swear to God, it is amazing that Teddy didn't cry. But all Teddy could do was go, uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> too scared uh -huh. to do anything yeah, too else. too scared to move. I mean, I would have at least you know, exited the scene, sure. right? So the long and the short of this thing, and I don't know how there aren't 10 million. Yeah, we, we've gotten 10 minutes of background okay. here. Take me I into why we should care about this so divorce. So apparently Tom has been funding her like to no end. And this is the thing where I think regular people 
have, we have no idea what it costs to really live these kinds of lifestyles that they do, you know, jumping on private jets all the time. I mean, you can plow through a lot of money. Okay. Oh, sure. We know that just, just from your background in private aviation, we know that it's not like five grand to get on a private jet. It's It's about 50. Yeah. When people try to say things like, oh, but it's kind of like, and you go, nope, it's not kind of like first class. It's, it's like, all of first class, like you bought all of first class and way more. Yeah. And mean? the stewardesses and the pilots yep. and the plane. And by the way, you're paying for the plane when it's sitting and you're paying the stewardess and pilots while they're sitting. So it's all of that. Anyways, um, Tom somewhere went awry within the law firm. He had a couple of huge settlements beyond the whole PG&E thing. And one was with Lion Air. I think that's that flight where... I think everybody on board was killed. It went yeah, down. Lion Air Flight 610. Uh, he was accused of embezzling settlement funds from that lawsuit it, that like he didn't pay anybody anything. So if anybody knows how it works, if you've ever sued somebody, if you sue somebody, let's say I'm suing you for $100,000 and let's say I win, okay? If I had a lawyer that is representing me, the check does not go to me. The check goes to my lawyer. The lawyer then takes off his 30, 40%, whatever that is, and pays himself. And then the lawyer gives me my check. That should happen fairly quickly. I mean, that is a pretty simple transaction, right? I mean, my 70,000 or $60,000 should not be sitting in your law firm for months on end. There's almost a piece of it that says, you should actually cut me the check before the check arrives to you because you know what it is. We we both know that that's coming my way. We already signed the contract, what the deal was. Okay. So, uh, apparently, I mean, and, and there's a couple other cases. There's one with a fire or something. I mean, these are like atrocious, heartbreaking, horrendous, catastrophic things that happened to people and that people died, right? And apparently Tom didn't take the additional monies, right? And ever pay the people. I don't know how that even happens in a firm, you know, I mean. Or I wonder if he was, I wonder if he was taking it and he was paying small portions of it, like small percentages over time, conflating how this was supposed to happen so that he could take the rest of it put it into his own lifestyle and clearly fund her lifestyle with the belief that he could almost Ponzi scheme it and win another case, pay these people off and then do the same thing moving Possibly. forward. Possibly. But keep in mind, there's a whole law firm here and True. there's an accounting department within this law firm. True. And I mean, there are a lot of people responsible that should be seeing all those transactions, right? Because he was, I mean, again, in my research, he was sued by a partner right. for not paying him as well. And even if we say that Tom was a derelict and a criminal, there are hopefully somebody else in that law firm that would have stood up, do you know what I mean? And said, we got a real problem here, yes. you know? So it does feel to me, I'm not going to say, well, no. The law firm was whatever the law firm was, okay? But here's what was really happening. He was getting the money. She, so this all, she announced- Let me, I'm going to, I'm going to wrangle you in here, okay? okay. Just so we don't spend the first 30 minutes talking about this. You don't- I'm talking to Amanda right now and I know she's super happy. I know. You don't believe that she was ignorant to where this money was coming from. No way. And so when she paints herself- As the victim saying that he was pushing her out of the marriage, that she knew of multiple infidelities and that the only way to save herself was to distance herself from him and that she's trying to wash her hands of all of this wrongdoing. You call you Debsy, the Edward R. Murrow award winner for journalism called BS. I call BS. So, you know, like, like, so like she's cried a couple times, which is a horrible thing to watch. Cause her face woman. still doesn't move. No. And it's a guttural. Like, I mean, it's awful. And her face is not moving the entire <laughs> time. Awful. So I do think she knew. And here's why I think she knew is because she had her own LLC in her name. I think it was EJ G. I love that. You know that she has an LLC. Erica in her name. Jane global or something of like that. Of course it's right? global. And Tom to date, we know has put $25 million in there. Shut up. Yeah. Uh, and we have all the bills. We've seen all the bills of how she spent that 25 million and the, um, executor of the, uh, bankruptcy has tracked that specific 25 million down to, she only tips Uber drivers a buck. 
like she, Uber Eats might get two bucks. Like she's a terrible tipper. My mouth is a so, gape at so twenty five million dollars. So she she I think she realized the rest of this was coming to a head and she's like, I got to get out and I have a, have to have a storyline to get out and I have to be a victim. Listen, she might be a victim of a lot of things, but when you've portrayed this badass, mean, scary person on camera, right? It is hard now to go victim, right? I mean, that's For sure. especially when we have a plethora of real victims and body counts. Yeah. I mean, she doesn't stack up to Nobody them. feels bad for the person who married into money, was given $25 million with to do whatever she wanted, and then says, I, he was pushing me out of the marriage. I spent it all. Also, he may have been corrupt in some capacity. Right. I'm the victim. I'm the victim. And then she moves into, I don't know if it's a rental house or whatever, but by it, it's, so it's certainly not palatial. It's not sure. Well, it's not her 16,000 square foot mansion. It doesn't have a chapel inside. Okay. Just and to let you know, that's not okay? a real home anyways. Exactly. That's it doesn't a have church. A, it has a ch- her other home has a chapel inside, but this, but it's a really nice upper, I'm going to say upper middle class, middle class yeah. you know, home. And that'll, that certainly the majority of people watching the show would be happy to of have, course. right? So uh, now that they've traced the $25 million to her, she's been sued directly because she has signed all the tax documents. She has si- I mean, she's signed everything. Yeah. So, you know, she's like, I don't know what I was signing. I don't even know how to use an ATM. Well, guess what? Stupid doesn't work in court. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's not a strategy or a defense, especially when you're in the world she was in. Yeah. She owned a business. Wake up, girlfriend. You should, You were in charge of your business. Yeah. I mean, money didn't just like appear and it was your job to spend. So I think she probably was a, I think she's a gold digger. Let's just be honest from okay. the very beginning. I think that that's in essence yep. who she is. I think she got tired of Tom at some point. Totally get that. I mean, no even judgment on that. And so she started out doing her own thing. She wanted her own glory days. She didn't just want to be Tom's wife. Remember, she was an aspiring actress. Yep. So now she finds this niche thing she can do that a lot of people that there's a fan base for, right? And she's on Real House of Beverly Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. And so, you know, she's with Andy Cohen, blah, 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 blah. All that plays out. And then guess what? I mean, she had a long ways to fall and I think she's still falling because now the lawsuit is directed at her. Great job, Deborah. Great job, Deborah. But here's going to be the real thing. I don't watch the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills religiously. I know almost all of this from just crap on Instagram. It'll be really interesting to see if those people that have stood by her on because she has a group on that show. Uh, meaning her uh, peers to see if they stand by her. And if anything new happens with the Erica Jane saga, you come to the leader in all things reality housewives, the Deb and Kev podcast. There we go. Let's start the podcast. Welcome to the Deb and Kev podcast. One is a Harvard Business School alum. The other is her son discussing business, pop culture, family, and everything in between. Now here are your hosts, Deb and Kev. Hey, hi, hello, and welcome to the Deb and Kev podcast. Right there, she's the way we became the Brady Bunch. It's my mom, Deb. I'm Deb. And I'm just taking it step by step and day by day by day. I'm her son, Kev, and this is our podcast. I know you know one of those shows. Do you know the other one? Uh, Day by day? Uh, Step by step. (laughs) (laughs) Clearly, I don't. But I couldn't figure out how we were the Brady Bunch. I mean, so I'm sort of like, oh, I was just trying to think of things. Do I have three stepchildren that I don't know about? Well, that's the basis of step by step. So we all know the Brady Bunch, right? right? right. It was one guy, his three sons, one gal, her three daughters. They got together. That's the way they became the Brady Bunch. Step by step was a dad who had two boys and a daughter, and then a mom who had two girls and a son. And the the difference was they didn't have the, not the nanny, the maid. The maid, that yep. They had uh, the cousin, the goofy cousin. But that was a a clear ripoff of the Brady Bunch, but made for uh, the 90s for TGIF. 
Oh, okay. There you go. So I, obviously I don't even know that. Nope. I walked right into yeah. it though. Day by day. Wasn't that Day good? by day. Mm, step by step. <laughs> On know. today's show, yeah. it's part four of Deb's five part series. And today she's going to talk about setting effective and healthy workplace boundaries. We, all of us <laughs> together have new questions uh. for dear Debbie and we'll swaddle this whole episode up like a newborn baby when we talk about what we are thankful for and what's for dinner. But first, Deborah, I think at this point in time in September, every kid is back to school, whether it's elementary school, high school, middle school, or college. Everybody is officially in the throes of education. As a parent, mm -hmm. was that a good day for you? When you looked at little Kev and you got done taking his picture on the porch and got to either drive him or usher him off with the walking group to school and just relax for the next six hours, knowing that you got to kind of have a reprieve until the principal called? I'm going to say yes and no. So okay. the yes is, first of all, I love September. I love the feel of September. I used to love to go to school. Yeah. So all of that feeling is all very good for me and it affects it. Yep. I do love it like, oh, he's going back to school. This frees me up. But it's also a pretty regimented schedule, right? Like we can't, spontaneity is gone pretty much. Meaning like if it were summertime, you know, oh, we it. could say, let's go up to Lake Tahoe today, or, you know, so I, that, I always have a little angst for that part of it. Just, and that's the part, like when you were little, just you and me doing things, whether it was dad forcing us to take you on junior golf all yep. over the planet or whatever. But I mean, I, there is a little piece of me that longs for that when that day comes. However, that having been said, I think there is like, ah, uh, he's back where he belongs. This is what he's supposed to be doing. And now for at least six hours a day, I am completely free. I yeah. would also think like, of course, that freedom is great. We've talked about how schools have shrunk uh, the, the, the seasons, if yeah. you will, so that it's not like three uninterrupted months during the summer where you're right. just planning for right. this, for, for a kid to be entertained for, what is it? 90 days, which is insane. Right. But is there another piece of it where you say, I'm just happy that I don't have to coordinate with other parents. Like I'm not having to figure out who's sleeping over, who's picking up for camp. I don't really like having little Tommy over at my house, but if I bright, but if I bring Timmy over, then Tommy has to come over and all these other things. Like you just get a reprieve from kids and planning in totality. Yeah. Sadly enough, Timmy and Tommy are names that did live on this street. However. Oh yeah, they actually did. They but actually I, did. I was not referencing any yeah. of them, but they were actually kids who lived on the so street. So we did, and I don't know if we've said this before, but we live on a street that is one block long. And when you were growing up, there were like, I don't know, six or eight. I mean, there were a bunch of boys that lived right on the street. And so, I mean, one lived around the corner, but you could just walk out the door and find playmates. So that True. part, you know, I mean, I guess I might call down the street and say, hey, Kevin's on his way down. I don't think any of us ever asked, you know, permission, if you will, unless we were taking our, you know, taking you and somebody somewhere. But, um, you know, I guess I look back, I don't have any bad feelings about arranging camp. And I arranged a lot of camps, you know. I hated camp. Did you hate camp? I hated all camps. Wait, this is it? This is it, I mean, ranch? I like this is it, but like this is it wasn't all summer. I feel like this is it was no, like no, for no. a couple weeks. Most of your camps were. I hated Colin Club Did camp. Did you hate Colin Club? I, I hated it because A, I had to wake up so early. Yeah, you had to go early. Had to yeah. wake up so freaking early. Yeah. We would go there. I mean, the kids were fine, but it was, I, I think I'd Wait. just rather hang out with you guys. See that <laughs> lies <laughs> therein lies our universal yeah. problem is that we all like each other and that would have been more fun. Yeah. But you, I mean, come on, Kevin, you got to play tennis. There was a huge Who pool. wants to play tennis? I hated tennis. And there was a pool. I wanted if, to go to the pool because then I could get an oversized chocolate chip cookie. And there were, there were arts and crafts and that. Stupid. Who cares about that? <laughs> there were, you could I go think I was aware that I was making something that I knew you were going to throw in the garbage later. <laughs> I still have some of your junk. So then, but you, wouldn't they let you play down on the, where the little crawdads are? Got to play in a man-made creek. 
but surrounded by in. grass that yeah. they would trim and yeah. they would you could yeah. know that they were starting to trim because yeah. you'd see the cut lawn coming down the man-made creek yeah. and they would say here's some ham go catch some crawdads here's some ham <laughs> <laughs> they give us something what? to go yeah. catch crawdads how did crawdads even end up in there i don't know but they're an invasive species and we should take it more serious okay <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Wait a minute. But you liked Camp Galilee up at Lake Tahoe. Sure. But again, that was only a week. And that we had to remember the crying fest. Yeah. Yeah. Just take you dropped there. me off. The most scarring thing in the world. And then picking me up was scarring because I didn't want to leave. I know that. But was that was only a week. That was okay. I knew yeah. that that was going to be over. No, I hated. <laughs> I think it was twofold. I, I didn't like waking up early. I didn't want to spend time with kids I didn't know. And I rarely knew anybody that I went to you camp You really with. do have this funny shy component yeah if you're not comfortable with i, I mean, didn't like any which of is that. like so unlike you but i did like going to the pool because that element like because we were members at colin yeah, i knew yeah. the pool and i knew the like the reception area and all that stuff so i was comfortable going in there well but then, and because you could charge food in there too exactly <laughs> but then they had like the kid barn right that big barn yeah, 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 that we yeah, would all hang yeah. out in and I, I didn't like it. I, it wasn't my thing. Nothing bad happened to me. I think people are waiting for me to say something bad happened to me. Nothing bad happened to me. I just didn't like it. Okay. And then did we, didn't you go to Lake Ridge for a while? Which had, we switched because. I hated it. You, you said the Colin pool. Yeah. You'd outgrown it. I, I think physically I had, I think like the deepest end was like six feet. I don't know. So then you wanted to go where a high dive was. A oh yeah. Pool. That was a blast. So then we went to Lake Ridge pool. Yeah. I always liked Lake Ridge. I don't think I ever did camp at Lake Ridge, okay. but I feel like I was old enough and we had, we knew enough people there that we could kind of be left we, I by, think, our, by like our lonesome. Like you were maybe 10 or 12. We yeah. could drop you at Lake Ridge yeah. and it was fine. And did you go play tennis indoors at Lake Ridge? No. You Who, didn't run around I, any When have I ever liked tennis? I'm, no, no, no. I, I might've done racquetball as okay. a joke. I might have, I definitely <laughs> swam in like their nine different pools. Yeah. I can remember that if you went to the concession area upstairs, you could order a different type of French fries. Oh, really? Which I did. Good to know. I think we worked out. We were just those annoying kids who were just like, watch me slam these hundred pound weights around. Right. <laughs> um, and then because it was somewhat insulated, you could just run around like a lunatic and nobody would re really ever say anything to you. And then yeah. we'd go scavenge for tennis balls. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you did that at Colin. Yeah. I mean, if like, I can remember you screaming at me to stop the car. Yeah. Cause there was a brand new tennis ball. It was like currency road. to me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was like currency. So, um, you know, people listening to this, you sound like a spoiled, awful For sure. child. Yeah, I'm pretty sure after 110 episodes, they already knew that, though. <laughs> I mean, but I think the camps that you didn't like are the camps where Dad and I had full-time jobs without oh, much I'm sure. flexibility. Yeah. So you had to go, Yeah. which during most of your growing up, we had a lot of flexibility. I just remember being more excited for school to start. Mm than being sad summer was over yeah. because I hated camp so much. <laughs> and so then, I mean, but I, there was never a time where I went to school where you thought like, oh, he's not, this isn't okay. I feel like I was always jacked up to go to school. I felt like, you mean every morning? No, 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 oh. like to start school. No, I would no, no. say the, the bloom was off the rose with school within the first five days, but yeah, I was yeah. very excited no, to no, go no. back. You were very happy to go back. You were happy, yes. We, I mean, when it was regular clothes, you know, we go buy school clothes, you were excited. When it was uniforms, even with that, you were, you know, no, you were great. About going to school, starting school, you were great. It was that second week on yeah. that killed us. It's yeah. like, oh, now we have the homework phase. Well, and you now, have homework now, and you got to get up every day. Now the teachers have properly identified yeah. me as the troublemaker yes, in the classroom. Yep, yep. When was, okay, and we can we can end on this question. What was the soonest a teacher ever reached out? Like brand new in their class and you say, why are they already calling me? So it was first grade. Yes. You're in a private school. Oh yeah. Hated that place. They hated you. Yeah, oh, yeah. You it was a mutual hate you. fest. And I mean, you were like, you cried the first day, you were quiet, you were sweet. I mean, I don't know. Like they knew it. They, they've seen enough problem <laughs> kids before. They're like, trust me, when this yeah. whole charade is yeah. over, none yeah. of us are going to like so him. So in the state of Nevada, Halloween is Nevada day. So often that's, we don't, you don't go well, to Well, technically school. Halloween is the 31st. Nevada day is the 30th, but they, they typically honor. Yeah. And each. we kind of, we can, we kind of combine them for trick or treating purposes. Yep. We kind of manipulate the heck out of it. But anyways, I will say that by Halloween, 
you were no longer welcome at that school nice. and I had to find you a new school. Yeah. First I'd like grade. to just go on record as saying what first grader could possibly alienate himself yeah. so much yeah. that a bunch of adults yeah. with, with, with no foul language, with no fighting, yeah. just it. And you can attest to this. And this is me defending. <laughs> this is 37 year old Kevin defending seven year old Kevin. Just like, Oh dear God, here we go. It was nothing more than outbursts of humor. Correct. It was outburst and not staying in your seat. That's it. Yeah. That's imagine, what it always is. imagine yeah. being so furious at a small cherub, chubby cheeked yeah, kid six. who was probably hilarious for his age group and just being yeah. furious with him. Furious with him. I will say there was some misbehavior on their part. Of course. Which ensured that I got all my money back and all the deposits back. They held back. me in during recess yeah, during to recess. scrub. <laughs> The teachers. Do you have any recollection of this? Yeah, you're goddamn right. I oh, do. Kevin, take that to no, no, scrub no. the teachers' microwave. Yeah, they held me in and from the recess pot, and the coffee pot to thing. scrub. Yeah. I was like little orphan Annie over here. <laughs> I'm I'm just like I'm 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 Cinderella. They're yeah. they're giving me all yeah. this stuff at six at six yeah. years old. Yeah, it's amazing. I made it to this part it's of amazing. my life. It's amazing that this trauma just didn't you know. Yeah. But then you went to the school that embraced you. Yeah, yeah, but I was pretty sure I got in trouble with that first grade teacher really oh, quick as well. Yeah, you know, and she even she even had the record. She knew what she was getting into. Yeah. I think the principal hand picked her. Yeah. And even she you know, what can I say? Yeah, I broke I her apolog too. I apologize to all the teachers out there who have had the misfortune of teaching my child. I'm That's sorry. Fair. That's a fair apology. Okay. Yeah. Well, I just was curious if if at any point you had utter excitement to kind of suspend being a mother yes. for six I hours a day. I loved going to school. So I think that tipped over on me. Um, I love, like I say, I love September, that beginning of, you know, the weather change and all that. Yep. So, yeah. All right, Deb, talking about setting boundaries with teachers and students alike, talk to us about setting those same type of boundaries at work. So one of the things, well, you know, the bigger topic is managing yourself. That's our five part. Right. Topic. That the overall theme of these five parts is how can one manage themselves at work? And the subcategory today for part four is setting healthy boundaries in the workplace. One of the things I think that happens in the workplace is we have our daily work, whatever that is, the stuff that's going to show up there every day, whether you do or not, that work is consistent and that work is ongoing. Then there is what I'm just going to call for the sake of this discussion, project work, meaning you do this, you put it to bed, it's over, and then something else starts new. But it's your job. I mean, usually, I would say the the daily work that comes is usually attached to other entities. So it's might be coming to you from a customer or it might be coming to you from another department. You're not just singular in your work. You're not just singular in your work. And so you're probably part of a flow. So if you don't keep up with that, you know, there's a real problem. Assuming that you can keep up with that, assuming, you know, that you've got all that in place, it's usually what I'm going to call the project work that kind of sets things off kilter a little bit. So if I know for myself that I like, here's what I know about myself. And we've talked about this before. I am the person that puts off the project to the last minute. That I will get true. it to you, but I, I put it off to the last minute. If you tell Deb, I need this on Thursday, the 15th at 10 26, you will absolutely get it by Thursday the 15th mm -hmm. at 1026. But if your hope is that you're going to get it any sooner than that, that's on you. Don't have that hope. I'm just telling you right now. Um, because I just move everything that direction and then sit on it, yep. right? So for me, it would be, I can move things to the last minute and I'm fairly comfortable with that. Other people work in a way that they're managing everything a little bit at a time through the process till the due date, if yep. that makes sense. Yep. All right. Here's what ends up happening. If we get tipped and usually it would be projects, sometimes it could be the daily business, meaning we're suddenly going to have more customers than we've ever had. They just did a marketing campaign. Suddenly that flow got really busy. It is up to us to speak up and set the boundaries. If you're working in a job where it's not advocated for you to work overtime, then you have to say, look, there's, I work 40 hours a week. This week, there's 50 hours of work here. You know, what do you want me to do? Yep. And when you set the boundaries, you're setting the boundaries just by asking that question. Meaning, 
we got 40 hours a week here, folks. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Now, if they say, are you available for 50 hours, meaning we're going to pay you time and a half or whatever your state says, and you want to do that, then that's all fine and great. But you've got to set the boundary. Or if they say, are you available for 10? You could say maybe five. And then they get to see. I think we don't say enough. We just grind until we, I'm going to say fail, either miss a date or become so distraught within ourselves. You know, it's all in our heads, but so distraught within ourselves that then we start dropping balls and then we're kind of not doing a good job anyway. So I think this is the place where we have to say, this is really about me. I mean, the workload isn't about me, but the, the amount of work that is coming across my desk for me is unmanageable given the certain set of circumstances that I have. What can I do? And and not in a complaining way, but you no. can just say, hey, I know how long this is going to take. This is on top of everything else that are kind of my normal duties. Do you want me to pause the normal duties to focus on this, which is totally fine. This stuff will get pushed to the back burner because there's a longer lead way with this. This needs to be done. But to finish this in the time frame that you want, it's going to either involve a secondary person yep. helping me yep. or me working in excess of 10 plus hours. Right. Now, if you work in a job where you're a salaried employee, which assumes you get to go to the doctor whenever you want, but it also assumes you're going to stay and get the job done, however long it takes. If you're in that kind of job, then you have to manage it yourself, but not in a silo. So one of the things that I do think ends up happening, like it's easy for me to stay a couple of extra hours and work or even come in on a Saturday morning when nobody else is there and knock it all out. I can do that to get the work done. But I still think I need to say, like we've exceeded what are the normal boundaries I've set for myself. So if I'm an exempt employee and I do work overtime and I don't get paid for it because it's considered you know, compensated my regular salary. And I am regularly working 10 or 15 hours a week extra. And I'm just using that for an example, because there's different industries that would expect more, right? But I'm regularly working 10 or 15 hours. And I think that is excessive. Then if I want to reset a boundary, I have every right to do it. But obviously, I've got to talk to somebody about it. Do you mean, otherwise, it's going to get the work is going to get piled up. Do you reset that in the form of your workload or do you reset that in the form of payment? Well, it can be reset in a number of ways. Number one, if it goes on and on and on and on and you don't feel like, you know, you're making $1.92 an hour right now, then that's one discussion. If it's going like I have no life because I'm only here, that's kind of a different discussion, right? So it can be a variety of things. In terms of workload, I mean, you're probably always going to have to get, I mean, unless you're pretty close to the top of the ladder, get somebody else involved because they're counting on you. I mean, if you say to your boss, it's time to, it's, it's time to hire that second person, right? I mean, that's what we need. Or maybe I don't need a full extra person, but I at least need a part-time person to get me through this. I mean, those are, those are in a way the beginning of our setting the boundaries, yep. right? Now the firm setting, if we come to agreement, then we've reset them amicably and that's okay. The firm setting, however, may be that you never came to the agreement and now you have to say, I'll work, I'll work 20 extra hours a week, but that's it. I mean, like, and I won't work weekends. Like I'll work into the evening That doesn't bother me at all, but you will not see me on the weekends. When I go home on Friday night, I won't show up again until Monday morning. So those are the kind of boundaries we get to draw. But the boundaries, I also want to say I'm using this for an example in terms of workload. But I think there are other boundaries too. Like I had an owner tell me um, that she likes everybody to show up to work 15 minutes early. That's kind of her thing. You know, like if they show up 15 minutes early... They have time to turn computers on. They have time to get their cup of coffee. They have time to chit chat a second to get to where they're going. And then it's like at the strike of eight o'clock, you know, like the doors fly open, the phones start ringing. Everybody's ready, if that makes sense. So I have no problem with that at all. But why don't you just make. Okay, so herein lies the problem. Yeah. If you're open eight to five and everybody got an hour for lunch, how do you get them to come in 15 minutes early and stay 15 minutes late to close up to do the same thing. That's an extra half hour in yep, there. For sure. And if these are hourly employees, you've now have them working an extra half hour a day. 
And a lot of people are like, I don't want to talk. You know, they, they just think it's 15 minutes, but it's not to well, the sure, employee. Because it's uh, 30 minutes on a Monday, 30 minutes on a Tuesday, 30 minutes. Yeah. So now it's two and a half hours a of week. free work that you've just had. Times yeah. 10 hours a month, 120 hours a year. That's a ton of free time. Well, times however many employees are doing it. Right. Right. I mean, so those are the things where it's a sticky wicket. So... Do you show up at eight o'clock and can you do all those things? No, I'm with the owner. Like 15 minutes is probably right. But I'm also saying like either we give only a half an hour for lunch because you don't have to give an hour. So we give it a half an hour for lunch and then we're okay. Or we pay them for it. I mean, figure it out. Right. Yep. And I think that's where employees need to set boundaries of look. I will, I'm available to work eight hours a day for you every day. And I'm available to stay late in some kind of emergency. But if I'm an hourly employee, I should get, I should get paid for it. And that we draw those kind of boundaries. I think the other boundaries we draw are what, like, I I just want to say pure boundaries. Like if you see people and I mean, one of the things that I really truly believe management does not have to manage everything. If I am sitting with somebody um, and their desk is close to mine and they're on the phone all and they do what I do and they're on the phone, their phone, meaning all day long. I mean, I get to say, you know, you're missing some of these phone calls cause you're on the phone. I mean, so it's also setting boundaries. You mean amongst your peer group sure. as well. Not escalating to- it to a manager, but just saying like, Hey, Tiff, yeah, I've I've taken three phone calls in a row because you refuse to get off your cell phone. That that's not okay. That's not okay. Exactly. So I do think when we talk about managing ourselves, it's really and I don't want to say like I'm a hater of strict rules, right? But managing things so that you can feel good in the place that you are, and that everything like the boundaries, if something does get a little over the boundary a little bit. It's not the end of the world for you. You still see it within the realm of reasonable, but that you can constantly reset. And then if it becomes a problem, you know where the boundary is. So you can talk, I'm going to say articulately and eloquently about it. Right. And so I just, I think that we look for other people to do that for us and solve it on an issue that really isn't talking about what the real issue is. You know, totally. Tiffany's on her phone. Yes, that's a problem. But how does that affect you? And what do we need to put in place so that it doesn't? That's the conversation we don't really have. So then let me ask you this question, because I'm sure some people are thinking about this. What happens if you're able to catalog all your thoughts? You can you you are able to bring a bunch of the different receipts as to how you're working too much, how you're not being paid comparable to the workload that you're putting out there. You bring it all to your boss. You have a very congenial conversation and they just say, it is what it is. So I think that's twofold. I would hope that a boss, if a boss didn't have the answer for this, um, and if they did say it is what it is, that would really bother me because I don't think we always get the answer we want. But hopefully we would have a answer that would not pacify but satisfy us or at least make enough of an explanation to get us through a period of time. Meaning a boss might say, look, I see this as a really temporary situation. You have no idea how I appreciate you hanging in there. But by the end of the month, I think all of this is going to be gone and that's not going to continue. And I mean, and if that boss were smart, what he'd realize is you were kind of at the end of your rope and he probably needs to do something nice for you. I mean, something appreciative, some kind of acknowledgement, right? But to just say this is what it is, then I would feel to me like we had just hit the end of the road together. For sure. I mean, I I think that's what the, the point that I was getting to, which is if you're able to put all of your thoughts together and they make sense and they're coherent and, and, and the compensation isn't matching up with the time or, or the workload is just far too excessive for one individual. And you're able to bring that to somebody who can actually affect change and, and says, I mean, this is just kind of how we operate. Good, bad, or in between. Now, you know, their stance and the, and the onus is on you to either stay there and, and change your thinking as to this position or to start finding a new gig somewhere else. Well, and it's, I mean, it's, it's just like a relationship. If you go to your partner and say, this thing that you're doing really is bothersome. It's not bothersome on a one-off, but it's bothersome over and over and over again. And your partner looks at you and goes, yeah, so sad, too bad for you. Yeah. I mean, that's, that feels like 
that's the beginning of a terrible communication, you know, uh, future. I mean, like yes. that you're not going to get there. Or you just say, do I really care that this person has to wake up and fart every morning? Is that <laughs> a deal breaker for me? Right. And if right. it's not, then you just deal with the farts. Right. Exactly. If I mean, yeah, and that would be pretty funny if that were the issue. And right? that's, that is setting appropriate boundaries. I agree. Both in I the agree. workplace and at home. <laughs> Next week, the end, the fifth installment, the final chapter, the end of the saga of Deb's five-part series on how to manage yourself in the workplace. Dear Debbie segment, three questions, two business, one somewhat personal and fun, (laughs) if I can find them. Okay. Question number one. Dear Debbie, I just had a big argument with my boss over what I felt was an injustice done to me during a conference call with a client. I'm the one who did all the work on the project and my boss interrupted me as I was making a presentation and basically took over and acted like it was all his idea. I was infuriated, so I told him as much. We ended up arguing. He claims that every project is his project. He had told me Ah. that I was supposed to present. I feel like I should apologize for blowing up, but I do not want to come, but I do not want to come to an agreement with him for how we present in meetings. I don't want to be the one to do all the grunt work, only to have him take all the credit, especially since he presented something totally different to me about how things were going to be. What should I do? Well, what you should do is you should tune into the Devin Kev podcast and listen to the five part series about how you should manage yourself in the workplace. So say the first sentence again. This is, I knew there was a word in here that was going to stick in. I wanted to pause after I read it and say, this isn't going to make sure that this, this author of this is not on, Deb is not on their side. Okay. The author of this email, Deb will not side with for the one word in this. <laughs> I just had a big argument with my boss big over what argument. I felt was an injustice done to yeah. me. Okay. So... Big argument and injustice. I knew Got it was injustice. The second somebody those. uses a word that is so rich and profound mm-hmm. and deep and applies it to a presentation at work, yep. Deb's Deb is off you. It's like betrayal or something yeah. like that. So first of all, big argument bothers me because I don't know. I mean, big argument. I mean, I think people are yelling at each other. I, right? I would agree a at thousand least percent. Raised voices. Yep. Okay. So that is like goes nowhere with me and I'm mad at both of them for doing it. Yep. Right. Um, injustice that falls. We've talked before about catastrophic words. Yeah. I think people use them too much. Totally. And I think that they redefine it. Like in his mind, yeah. he's making this way bigger than what it is. Injustice is something that like, like happens on a societal level. It's Erica Girardi. Yeah. <laughs> and injustice yeah, is exactly. uh, my, my family died in a plane crash and somehow she has $25 million in her bank account exactly. and she's buying leader hosen with it and not tipping Uber and okay. not tipping me, her Uber driver. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so yeah, that could be a double whammy. Totally. That, right. So, uh, listen, I have been in a situation before where I've done some prep work on this Mm -hmm. and somebody else kind of wanted to do the talk on it. And I am like, Oh no, not going to happen now. A little different when it's your boss, right? For sure. If I'm doing the work, I'm going to do the talk. I'm going to at least be part of the talk. Okay. If I'm doing the work. So, but you know, I don't really have a boss. That's easy for me to say. If you have a boss, I mean, you know, they get to say in that moment, if it's a presentation to a client where the boss feels like this is big and it's going to bring additional revenue, or you're just trying to capture this client for the first time, if at the last minute the boss feels I'm I'm the guy or girl to, to make this pitch, yeah. right? It's me. Then you've got to go with that. I mean, they're doing what they think is best for the company. They're doing what they think is best for the team at that point. And it is sad that it couldn't have gotten, that it could have, couldn't have been communicated in a way that everybody could celebrate it if they landed it. Right. Yep. I do think that this is a bigger issue. I would, I think there's two fronts here. You have the boss who says, any project done is my project. That is yeah. a thousand yeah. red flags. And all that could mean is the buck stops with me. Sure. Which, which is totally legitimate, but that's very bad. But language. if you're, if you're going to take credit for everything in the form of literally taking credit right. for it, saying it was you who brought this to the table, 
Holy moly. But then let's not forget, they were in a really big argument and he felt injustice. Do you know what I mean? So the boss is also, that's the whole thing about the big argument, people, is everybody's going to escalate. And now the boss is going to use language that may not truly depict what he genuinely feels. Agreed. Okay. I mean, if any boss ever said that to somebody, you should pack up your your, your your stuff and and leave. Yeah. But it would make sense if the boss said, look, at the end of the day, the buck stops with me on this stuff. This client was really big. I've seen what you've done before. You do a good job. I just felt like this one might get weedy. And I, so I made the call. I made the call for me to do it. And then you get to talk about, you know, what are the parameters where the boss feels comfortable with you doing it and why didn't and here's really the question why didn't the boss feel comfortable with you doing it you need the answer to that question whether you want to hear it or not you need the answer I mean because even if you don't agree with them then you need to help change his perception of you yeah and your capabilities I agree I think they approached it entirely wrong you went in there super duper defensive which is normal but instead the conversation should have been you you knew I worked hard on this you knew I had put together a very good presentation. I don't understand why you felt the need to take ownership of it when you your fingerprints weren't anywhere on this. Is there something I did in the presentation? Is there something I did in the documentation that made you feel you needed to step in when everything leading up to this point felt like it was all green for go? Because then you're willing to have an actual conversation and you're giving them the opportunity to give you some constructive criticism. Even if you don't want it, you can at least put their feet to the fire to point out the things that may have been, you know, concerning to them. Well, and on the Dear Debbie segment, we absolutely insinuate all of our biases. Of course. And we read it the way we read it. Somebody else could have heard that differently. But, you know, in a perfect world, I mean, how is there not time for the boss to pull him aside and say, listen, this could be my own insecurity. I'm getting nervous about this. I am so sorry, but I'm making the pitch. I'm about to commit an injustice on you. I'm about to commit an injustice. <laughs> but I mean, I would hope the person wouldn't, I mean, hopefully the boss just wouldn't get up and start talking. That would sure. be Sure. I, I feel honestly. like we're missing yeah. pieces here to yeah. this email because yeah. if you're, if you're connecting the dots, what you're assuming is this person gave an entire pitch. The boss then stood up, took ownership of it. That person then feels somewhat comfortable going at their boss. The boss feels comfortable with them coming at them and then comes over the top and says, well, all of this stuff is mine. There are far more layers associated with this particular circumstance than I think they're letting on because none of this stuff rings as isolated incident, isolated incident, isolated isolated incident. It feels like it's a a totality of something much bigger. So once I had a situation where uh, I was kind of being interviewed to work with some people, right, in my current situation, and I had talked to two of the people a couple of times, and they said, we would like you to make a presentation to us about this subject as if it were training material, right? I mean, I was like, I can do that. No big deal. But so I prepared for that subject, got it on the day. And it was, uh, it's been during COVID. So on the day of the zoom, a third person showed up who I just met on that zoom, literally. Right. And that third person said, I actually don't want to hear about that subject and picked another subject out entirely different. Right. And said, I'd like you to speak to that. Like this is like as if I'm teaching a workshop in a presentation form, which I was not prepared for. And the other two people didn't say, well, wait, we I mean, I did say this is what they asked for. Right. And that person just went, you know, shove that aside. This is what I'd like you to speak to. I mean, double down on it. And in that moment, I'm looking at the Zoom and I don't know that I felt injustice at all. I kind of felt like, whoa, this went a little sideways. Right. You, you know, I did for that moment feel a little bit like, why aren't the other two of you speaking up here? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Saying something. I felt like that. And then uh, that's about all the attention I gave to it because really what happened in that moment was, can I pivot? Yep. And can I go to that subject matter and do it a good enough job? to make it sound like I could teach it, right? Sure. And so if I really thought I couldn't, meaning I had I didn't have any kind of frame of reference for it, the answer should have been no. And no would have been a fine answer. Like, no, I'm not prepared to talk about that without being prepared, Yeah. right? But I said, 
okay, let's do it. And I just winged it, you know, it went great. It was truly fine. To this day, do I think that that was like an injustice? No, it's not that big of a thing at all. And here's what ended up happening. Because I did choose to do it, because it went well, now it's a little feather in my cap, just in my mind, not in their minds, in my mind, right? So it's a little feather in my cap. Under adverse situations, I still performed, right? I mean, I still made it all okay. Dear Debbie, I've been working the same job for 30 years. Recently, we switched to working online. It was a hard adjustment, but I'm getting used to it now. My issue is that I'm realizing that I'm very bored with my job. I'm close to retirement age. I don't really want to retire, but I don't want to be in this job anymore. How late is too late to switch careers? Should I even bother switching careers or should I just retire early? I feel like there's a lot of a lot of layers to this question and it's very topical. I mean, if somebody graduated from college when they were 22 and went and got a job at that company and worked there for 30 years, they're only 52. Right. I mean, I don't know. that. Can you retire? I mean, I guess I don't know what's in your bank account. If there's enough money in your bank account, I mean, you're not going to collect Social Security. You're not going to collect pension benefits at that age. Well, say that say that they found the new job at 30. So they've been working there for 30 years. So they're 60. So they're still light on the retirement age, but they maybe have enough in their 401k enough saved up. They don't have a lavish lifestyle where they can say, well, if I retire five years early, my monthly expenses are going to be a little more trimmed than they would be in five years. But I don't know that I can keep doing this gig for five more years. You mean their monthly payout? What yeah. Getting, yeah. So, I mean, I, I do think that all those, I think that that is a really crucial, 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 crucial place in life. And I would not want them to give up. I'm going to say, incredibly important benefits that would otherwise be available to them for the rest of their lives. Okay. So I'm just saying that, and I am normally not a benefit queen. I don't run that way, but I mean, they've given 30 years. Let's not walk away from a lot of optimal benefits right now. So I would say that has to be measured. That's part of the measuring, you know, that we're going to do. But the other part of the measuring is, man, you're 60 years old. You're in, you're coming close to the evening of your life, if you will. And you absolutely should go for it if there's something else you know you want to do. So then I would probably say, is this something else? Is it a real job like you know you can go apply for and you can get with your age, with the job experience you've had? You know, I mean, like you have to be, there are times, and I know this because I'm of this age, where age works really well for you. And then there are other jobs where age doesn't work so good. For I was going to say, is somebody going to feel compelled to, if you've been in the same position for 30 years, I assume the industry standard is probably not 30 years, but people being in that position for a while, right. is somebody going to want to hire you knowing that you're of a certain age and knowing that they might only get three, four, five years out of you when the expectation is 10 to 15. Right. You've really got to be able to pitch it. Yeah. And so I do think it's like if you're going to work for a corporation or you're going to start something for yourself, those are all two different things. Um, You know, there's a piece of me and the heart piece of me goes like, if you know what that thing is you want to do, oh, for heaven's sakes, please go do it. Oh, sure. You know, I mean, I just support that. I just, the other part of me is like, I don't, I've never given 30 years to anything like that. Same. You know, so... Um, I don't know that feeling, but I do believe that that's an enormous investment and that you want to maximize your investment. So I think it's weighing those two things, but you know, maybe you could finish out that job for whatever period you need to, and maybe you could be doing the legwork on the new thing. I was getting your foot in the door. Also go have a conversation with somebody who means something. You've been there for 30 years. Your equity is no, is never going to be better than what it is right now. If You've done a good job. I mean, if you were well perceived, yeah. if you've been horrible for 30 years, you've been horrible. I don't know what to, that's a whole different question, but if you've done a good job, I mean, I really think like you get to go in and say, because this is what I would say, Hey, you know, before COVID, I loved coming to work. I love the office. I love the water cooler talk. I love all the people I work with. This is a great company. Then COVID came and all of those things that I thought made the company a great company were kind of taken away from me. Now I'm at home working alone and I realize I still love the company, still love the people, don't get to see them enough, but I really don't like the work because that's what the job has come down to is just the work. Yep. If we are ever going to come back to work, 
or even if we're going to stay home, I need new work. I mean, that's a really, really fair conversation. I agree a thousand percent. I feel like all of this stuff can be solved with a very candid conversation. Yeah. 30 years. But if you're a really bad employee, then I'm going to change my advice yeah. and say you should stay there for 30 years and get your benefits. And congratulations yeah. for <laughs> congratulations. being a horrible employee and knocking it out for 30 being years. Good for you. Yeah. Dear Debbie, my father-in-law is loud and opinionated, but his latest statement takes the cake. I am due to give birth to a baby this September. Mm. The catch is the due date is my father-in-law's birthday. He has made a pronouncement to the entire family that he will be very upset if I have the baby on his birthday as he doesn't want to share the day. This is not a joke. (laughs) The rest of the family hopes I have. Why am I laughing? Yeah. Because it's outrageous. The rest of the family hopes I have the baby on this date just to spite him. I wish I were a million miles away. Frankly, at eight months pregnant in the Texas heat, I don't have much of a sense of humor left. I would like the birth of my baby to be a time of joy, not the punchline of some sort of adolescent level joke. What do I do? I don't think it is an adolescent joke because she told us it wasn't. She told us he was super serious about it. So it's what not an adolescent joke. What can anybody do about the birth of a child? I, and this woman is obviously not scheduling a C-section Or something like that. Right. I'm assuming she's going to go into labor and that baby is going to come into the world when it decides. Right. Mm -hmm. So like, I don't know that I would spend a second. Could you fathom being the type of person who is dead serious when they say you better not have that baby on my birthday? That's crazy. You, the only thing this woman owes owns is that you married into this family. And most people would be like, is there any chance that child's going to be born on my birthday? Right. And they would love it. I wouldn't like it. I don't want to share my well, birthday with anybody okay, either. You're but like that. I'm selfish and I know that about myself. Even then, I wouldn't say, baby, better not be born on my birthday. So last year, uh, our friend Katie gave birth to her little boy, Luke, uh-huh. the morning of my birthday. I Were was, you furious? I was so happy. <laughs> I said, thank you so much for the birthday present. And Luke was a preemie. He came yeah. early, right? So it was a, a huge surprise that it happened on my birthday. But I now am like, hmm, you know. Oh, of course. Because like awesome. who cares? Yeah, who cares? That is, I mean, and, does and, he, he has to know that other people on the planet are born on his birthday. Uh, this right? guy probably, if if he was your best friend and yeah. found out that your birthdays were both September 28th or whatever, he'd be like, sorry, dude, can't yeah. do it. I'm unwilling to share this time with yeah. you. Because I want to say, what what comes to you on your birthday? What do you think you're going to have to split time with? You're probably in your 50s or 60s. You don't have that much time anyways <laughs> to care about your birthday. Well, the other thing is, as you get older... You kind of care less and less. Well, that's less. what I'm going to say. You like what? What is it that, that you're looking forward to? The big seven five, right? That, to where you think this kid is going to steal your shine as it relates to that? What is your issue at I all? Know. And how can you look anybody in the face and say, "I'm pissed"? You know what he knows. <laughs> this is what he knows. No matter what, if this is baby is a boy, if this baby is a girl, he can't hold a candle to compete against. The birthday. He can't. Of course you can't. Sweet little child. But because it doesn't like birthdays have stopped meaning anything to any of us. I don't know, after twenty five. Yeah. Like if oh, you're maybe thirty. Yeah. I yeah. mean, okay, we'll say thirty. Thirty is the last because once you're out of your twenties, it's just a stark reality <laughs> that you're getting older. So after you turn thirty, birthdays don't mean yeah. anything. Yeah. They don't mean anything anything. So if you're in your fifties or sixties, the fact that this kid's being born on your birthday, taking away the attention from you should actually be a good thing. Cause for all everybody else is concerned, you're just going to be stuck at 62 for the rest of your life until you die. Well, here's the truth. If I have a party for little Jimmy and little Jimmy, Hey, happy birthday, little Jimmy, Mm -hmm. any party I have, I mean, I could do, I could have a party for i could at the same party have stuff for grandpa right yeah nobody cares about grandpa this is a dual party grandpa's asleep in the recliner jimmy's running around outside spend time with both exactly it just uh, 
I don't, that, that is the most ridiculous thing because I think 99% of the people would say, who cares? Who cares? Be born on my birthday. Right. What a fun thing that would be. The twist to this would be if the father-in-law was only 25 and the mother was only 13. Okay, yeah. sure. Maybe yeah. he has some, some, some spite when it yeah. comes to that. The fact that questions like this exist in the real world well, is bizarre yeah, to yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that is, and the fact that, you know, also too, it's like, this one of the things that I do think is like let's be careful what we say to pregnant women. I mean, of course, come on, especially you know? pregnant during the summer. And this is not your daughter; it's your daughter-in-law. Yeah, you don't have the same license to speak to her the exact same way you'd speak to your son, right? I mean, it's different. Well, I'll tell you this: the guy who thinks he has a right to his own birthday <laughs> definitely feels he has the right to talk yeah, to anybody the way he wants. No, no births may happen yeah, on this day ever exactly. again. Exactly. Yeah, crazy guy. All right, Deborah, what? is for dinner this evening last time you went rogue we had split pea soup in august <laughs> what are you thinking will be for the meal so tonight? okay last time i went rogue you did i did and it was fantastic so that was the funny thing you and dad were both kind of like mm, mm, mm. i mean it was a 92 degree day yep and I smell ham yeah. and, and peas. And I thought, okay. <laughs> and then you spoon out ham and split pea soup. It's 92 degrees outside. It's a smoky day. Just not the setting that you're looking yeah. for. It was delicious. But I felt like it when you asked me. So it was super funny because I said to dad, split pea soup. And he kind of went, mm, yeah. you know. And then that guess what was for dinner? Split pea soup. It was great. And he, I said, do you want, like, how, what size of bowl would you like? And uh, he said, just a small one. Sure. And then gobbled it down, practically licked the bowl and said, this was great. It was Dad. great. Yeah. So uh, if anybody needs that split pea recipe, I'll be happy to provide it. Very easy. And I made it in an instant pot. Yep. So um, we're going to go back to one that we undid. Okay? What did we undo? If your friend John in Pennsylvania is listening to us, oh, okay. we're in trouble. So I always say it wrong. P-H-O. Say it. Fa? Yeah. Is it fa? Totally. Okay. Well, I'm, if it I, sounds like the beginning of a bad word, you're right. It's been on my brain for so long okay. that we're going to try it. Love it. Okay. We're what kind of meat are you going to put in there? I think shrimp. What do you think? I don't think pho traditionally comes with, in? I think it's always some type of it's always pork like, or yeah. beef. But is it like, okay. Because so pho, typically what they do is they they boil the bones and the meat to get the broth, to get that right. broth, and, and is so it just they, that meat that's off of there? I think so. Okay, then we'll make it work. Well, it'll be meat. I this mean, I don't care. Do time. shrimp. It's I not like even, yeah. Here's the truth. Well, I haven't even looked at a recipe yet. We're, we're not like a traditional Vietnamese yeah. family over here. You can <laughs> do whatever doing you this want with a recipe that I have not yet found. Love it. I will look as soon as we get done here. Well, so, yeah, this is going to be an amazing yeah. dinner. Deb, what are you thankful for this week? What's just sitting in your craw of happiness? What is sitting in my craw? Do you want me to go? Yeah. We we just got back from Chicago. We had a great trip to Chicago. We got out of the smoke. We traveled to the middle of the United States where you and I have said profusely we will never live. Not a condemnation on the people that live yeah. there. Yeah. But that's not for you and I. We we grew up around mountains, so we can't deal with the flat. But I adore Chicago. I love that city. It's like New York light to me. It's easy to get around. It's got great food, wonderful traditions, love the ambiance of the city. Super duper happy that we got to spend about a week's time in the Windy City. I was going to say the biggest little city. That's so mine we was going to be the same for all of your reasons. Okay. However, also the air. I mean, what well, goes without saying? Goes without saying. Give me let me inhale diesel fuel and subway fumes yes, over all day smoke. Long. All I day will long. welcome yep. all of that as opposed to just knowing that I'm breathing air that is slowly taking my life. If from I me. can see through the air and yep. still have to inhale pollutants, yeah. I'm fine. And I'm it's happy when I can't see through the air. Yeah, I'm happy seeing through the air and just seeing 
extreme homelessness. I'm okay with that. I'm happy seeing, looking through the air and seeing the chaos of a big city like Chicago. I'm just happy that I can see things again. Okay, so I'm not happy seeing extreme homelessness. Oh, I'm record. not happy seeing it. I'm just happy seeing it. Just being able to- I'm not happy yes. seeing You're it. happy seeing it so that I'm you happy can do seeing something it. about it. Right, I'm yes. happy seeing it, not happy seeing, <laughs> seeing it. it. Yeah, I, okay, you get it? I got you. I got you. So Chicago is a breath of fresh air. Love it. New. I, yeah. I mean- other it's than, a great city. Other than the winter months, which I, when I was working with Dinner Lab, I, I was in and out of Chicago four or five times, all between the months of January and March. Woof. Brutal. Yeah. Absolutely brutal. But I love the city. I yeah. love everything about it. Yeah. It's incredible. It's incredible. It is absolutely incredible. So, uh, yeah. And we like it to be called the Windy City because if anything blows in, guess what? It'll blow right out. It blows right back out. Yeah. Anything else, Deb? No, I think we're good. Then that's going to do it for this Monday's episode of the Deb and Kev podcast. Remember to like, rate, and review wherever you listen to this particular podcast. And you can follow us on all of our social channels at Deb and Kev Pod. And this episode in particular, like all the Monday episodes, will be on our YouTube channel at Deb and Kev Pod. Mom, I love you to death. I love you, baby. We'll see you guys on Thursday. Thank you for listening to the Deb and Kev podcast. Remember to like and subscribe wherever you listen to this podcast. Follow Deb and Kev on Facebook and on Instagram and Twitter at Deb and Kev Pod.